adapting, any problems in the difference in styles of doing things, right? Especially in our business, delivery, timeline, KPIs, all those things are so important, right? Those things become, you know, very, very, you know, evident. And that's what I think has really uh, been one of the best things we have done um, because things will go wrong with clients and then you have to figure out how do you solve them as a team, right? Things will go right, things will have, people have different ways of working. And so that, you know, for us has been kind of the saving grace when we've done transactions is making sure we work together uh, with that leadership team on a project for a client, despite the risks, right? We could piss off one of our great clients that we have um, because we brought in a partner that doesn't work, but it's a risk worth it worth for us because it saves potentially years of pain down the line. Welcome to Grow Think Tank. This is the one and only place where you will get insight from the founders and the CEOs of the fastest growing privately held companies. I am the host. My name is Gene Hammett. I help leaders and their teams navigate the defining moments of their growth. Are you ready to grow? You know culture is important as your company scales, but when you acquire a new company, do you think about culture first or is it an afterthought? Well, there's a lot to think about when you're acquiring companies. Is there a value increase by acquiring this company? Do they have technology? What kind of integrations have to be done? All of the things necessary for you to look at an acquisition must be thought of intentionally. But one of the things that often gets forgotten is the importance of culture in acquiring companies. When you are combining together executive teams, when you're combining together talent and cultures, you want to make sure you've got a great fit. And it takes some special thinking to do that. Today, our special guest has done this multiple times. Uh, he's had five acquisitions. He is the CEO of Stadium Red. We're talking with Claude Zadano. Claude really shares with us how he looks at culture and why it's such an important piece to the acquisition process. And when you think about you know, creating the right culture fit and integrating that into the company, it's so important to really realize the value of the acquisition. So today we dive into that. Before we get there, I want to make sure you know that we have this special thing going. It's called Fast Growth Boardroom. If you are a founder, CEO, or president of a fast growth company, then we want to invite you to look at Fast Growth Boardroom, where you can hang out with your peers. We're building a community of people with training, but also real insight around how to become the best leader possible, how to create the best culture for your company, and how to increase the value of your company. If you, that interests you, go to Fast Growth Boardroom. You can check out how we play together through racing Porsches and some of the other things we do, but also how we actually engage with each other about why that's important and why you should be hanging out with your peers of the fast growth companies like Inc. 5000. This is the place where you could actually evolve as a leader. Just check out Fast Growth Boardroom, see if it's right for you. Now, here is Claude. Claude, how are you? Hey, I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here on Grow Think Tank, where we talk about founders and leaders really driving companies and scaling them beyond what their peers are doing. You have had a fast run with Stadium Red. Tell us about Stadium Red. Yeah, so Stadium Red is a marketing agency collective. Um, we've grown through both organic and inorganic growth. Most specifically in the past three years, we've made five acquisitions. Um, and our business is a prim primarily a collective of complementary, non-competitive, highly specialized marketing agencies. So we have currently five different marketing agencies kind of on one platform uh, and they all provide different types of services. And for our clients, the benefit is that they can work with one agency, three agencies, five agencies, it doesn't matter. It's completely seamless and easy for them uh, because we're really a true hub and spoke model. So our, our model is an e the answer to maybe the uh, traditional holding companies of the world. Um, and you know our plan is to continue kind of on this trajectory growing um, and, and delivering great services for our clients uh, by way of bringing together some of the best uh, boutique, highly specialized uh, agencies in the world. So Claude, since you talked about the five acquisitions, that's one reason why I wanted to have you on the show today, because you've done enough of these where you, you know what to look for, what some of the gotcha points are with acquisitions, but mainly around the leadership and culture integration point. Because I think a lot of acquisitions fail because they're not able to integrate the culture and the leadership 
of the acquired companies. What are your thoughts around that? I think that's spot on. I mean, I think the one thing I've learned, the, probably the, the truest thing I've learned through this whole process is typically when you're making an acquisition, you're always keeping the leadership team of the company you're acquiring in place, right? You don't want to buy a company and then have it uh, go by the wayside because the loyalty or the leadership or it goes, goes away. But I think one of the things most buyers or even sellers when they're selling their company to somebody else, having an exit, what you, what you miss, uh, and people always look at last, which honestly needs to be one of the first things, is the cultural connection, right? Is it, it, it's, it's, you're going to be going through the trenches, you know, whether it's integration, whether it's when things go wrong, uh, you know, nothing ever happens exactly the way you want to. And I think there's an inclination when people are doing deals, especially when you're exiting yourself, you just want to get the deal done. Everyone wants to get a deal done because they're excited about it, but they miss the cultural piece so often. And it makes it incredible. That is really one of the biggest reasons of why an organization makes or breaks it, right? If, 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 you're, if you're selling to somebody else and their vision for where the company needs to go or their way of operating is so different and something you don't aspire to or want to be a part of, or you're not open to because you've been doing it your way for so long, it's going to be very difficult to make that work. Right. And um, yeah, so I think that's one of the, the, I mean, I can give some examples of where it's gone well, well and where it's gone wrong. Um, but I think, you know, most other challenges are surmountable, right? Personnel, overlap, any of those other sort of things that, you know, you might have, right? The, the first thing people think about when they're, when they're doing a deal is, oh, where are the synergies? Where can we cross sell clients? Where can we be more efficient around costs? But again, you can't under you can't de undervalue the importance of of the cultural and people connection, especially in the marketing and advertising world, which is where we are, where our business is so predicated on people, right? There's IP and technology and little other things, but we're not making products, we don't have big factories, so it's all about how people come together uh, and that collective genius, if you will, that then translates into great work for great clients. Claude, do you have a framework that you use when you look at the culture of a company you might acquire? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the beginning. We didn't. <laughs> I have to be transparent. You know, you learn a lot from, well, you know, you learn a lot from doing things and them not going the way you want them to be uh, or, you, you, or you thought that they would, right? And so I think part of it is objective and part of it is subjective. So the objective part, um, we typically use culture surveys that we've built up, right, to not only survey the leadership team and kind of their approach and thinking, but all the way down to the individual employees within an organization, um, which can be challenging, especially if you're going through a deal flow, because sometimes leadership doesn't want to let the employees know that there might be an exit or an opportunity. So timing that and how that's done is, is, is important. We've had some creative ways around that. But yeah, a big thing is a culture survey. We also have done some stuff using some kind of our own testing of basically like, how do we think these personality traits, you know, fit within you know, our way of working, our, our approach, right? And then the other part of it is really a little bit subjective of kind of breaking bread and sharing your, your ethos, your thought process um, and, and spending a lot of time, and right? And so that's why even from a deal perspective, every single transaction we've ever done, I have spent almost all my time really getting to know um, those individual sellers, right? Um, personally, it's not just like the, pro some of the problems with, with, with when you're exiting is you get bankers in the middle, right? And so bankers, while they're great because they give you kind of that arm's length protection, they negotiate for you, et cetera. Um, you need a lot of, you know, seller to buyer time, you know, leadership to leadership time, bonding time, breaking bread. I mean, it's hard now in the pandemic because you can't get in front of people, have a dinner, but you really got to think about, is this somebody you want to get into a relationship with, a marriage with, right? Because no matter how you slice it, whether it's a small piece of your bigger puzzle, if you're an acquirer, or whether it's your only transaction you ever want to do as a seller, um, that's really important. So I think, you know, that that's the other part that we spend. It's just a time thing, right? So we can do all the objective survey. And we can look at all the data, we can see, oh, look, you know, they have a similar way of working and, you know, we can kind of get over that, right? But there is the subjective of, of literally just investing the time and, and having the true like heart to heart conversations uh, that are a little bit, um, you know, if they're a little bit difficult to have sometimes, right? People are always posturing when they're selling, they're trying to only show the good sides of their businesses, not the bad sides, right? And we all have both sides. Um, and so I think that's, yeah, that's something I, I personally focus a lot on uh, in, in terms of getting a deal done. I want to go zero in on this whole leadership thing, because 
a part of acquiring another company is acquiring the, the talent and the ability to lead others. Um, is there one thing that you're looking through? I know you're looking for a lot of different things, but is there one thing that stands out that you're like, oh, I can size up the way this person leads because of this one thing? Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, you know, when I, when we, you know, take a step back, right? I think part of this is driven by why you're doing an acquisition, right? If an acquisition is purely for, and there are people who do deals this way, right? Or selling their business, like someone just wants a patent, IP or technology or whatever it is, right? That's it's much more transactional, right? In our case, when we're doing a deal, we're typically looking to either bolster an existing service um, or add a new line of service to our business. And so the number one thing we do is we try to, before we ever do a transaction, work together. And what I mean by that is cross sell a piece of business, right? So say, hey, we have a trusted client. So we're taking risk on our client. We're gonna say, hey, we have a, a client that's important to us and we know they can benefit from this service. Let's now get that team involved. Let's get the leadership team directly involved, not have them just pass it off to somebody else, right? But have them part of that process, sell in that business and then work together without even having been in transaction. This is like one of our most important due diligence things because what will happen is you all of a sudden very quickly, any problem in that way of working, any problems in the difference in styles of doing things, right? Especially in our business, delivery, timeline, KPIs, all those things are so important, right? Those things become, you know, very, very, you know, uh, evident. And that's what I think has really uh, been one of the best things we have done um, because things will go wrong with clients and then you have to figure out how do you solve them as a team, right? Things will go right. Things will have, people have different ways of working. And so that, you know, for us has been kind of the saving grace when we've done transactions is making sure we work together uh, with that leadership team on a project for a client, despite the risks, right? We could piss off one of our great clients that we have um, because we brought in a partner that doesn't work, but it's a risk worth it, worth for us because it saves potential potentially years of pain down the line. Now, hold on. Claude just talked about working together and finding a best way to do this initially. This is a lot like dating. And I know there's a lot of dating inside of the business context, but you want to make sure that you date before you get married. And so working together is a great way for you to find the how you're going to work together, how you're going to collaborate, how you're going to work through challenges. Claude really talks about some of the details there, but I really want you to think about next time you look to acquire someone is you date first. It would be really important in your journey to creating something that's really valuable for both companies. Back to Claude. I want to kind of focus our conversation on what happens after the, the merger and acquisitions that comes in, because you've got to now align executive teams together. The current team you have with Stadium Red, but also these, these acquired company uh, executives, sometimes they're probably not going to be a, a fit going forward. Maybe they don't want to stay. Um, what are your thoughts on creating that alignment across the team? Yeah, I think, again, it varies on a case-by-case -case basis, but I'll say typically for us, you know, we have because of our style, right? We typically try to avoid um, companies that are selling in a process, right? What that means is bankers are involved and they're kind of shopping it around to a whole bunch of different people. Um, there's a lot of strategic reasons why we do that. You know, uh, one, we don't want to be in bidding wars or things like that. That, by the way, is not necessarily the best thing for the seller all the time. Sometimes you might get the best economical deal if you have bankers shopping you to a whole bunch of different buyers, um, right? But for us, you know, that's not how we typically approach. And I think the other thing we don't typically do is we, we typically look for companies where we can extract value, right? So we're a strategic buyer. We're not a, a private equity roll up or we have some big pool of capital that we just need to deploy and get done. And so for us, we're looking for those intangibles, which I think applies into when you start looking at companies and leadership. And we look for transparently, even things that have problems, right? Things that, you know, typically, oh, they're so concentrated in a few clients or, hey, the leadership team is really great in marketing and their vision and their execution but the finance person isn't awesome, right? And so a lot of what we have done is when we look at these businesses, we're trying to one, fill out our overall leadership team right across all our agencies and see, is there a leader or two within this organization that could be elevated out to complement what we already have going on, right? And then beyond that is, are there ways that we might be able to transition leaders, um, aka and be someone who's leading finance, right? Who isn't so strong, you know, with, you know, into our existing finance team and create cost savings for that, right? And that doesn't happen overnight, right? And, and there's obviously a human element to this. You know, we we do not approach things of like, hey, we're on a chopping block and, you know, day acquisition happens, we're just 
getting rid of everybody, here's your package and go, right? I think that kills culture. Um, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, we're looking at these businesses because we believe they're great businesses and because the leaders have something special, we do try to repurpose and, and, and do that. So it's a very hands-on evaluation from a people perspective. You know, at the end of the day, you can't have too many leaders in it. You can have too many leaders in an organization to be clear, right? You don't want too many cooks in the kitchen, as you say. So I think you need to be careful. Um, but that goes into our upfront initial thinking, right? Unless you know, you're in the position where you're just buying something and you're transitioning the, the, the leaders out and they have golden parachutes. And some people do that, right? There are plenty of acquisitions where you're like, we have a leadership team we like, we think you guys will fit in, you're going to help us transition and integrate and then you're out, right? And that's fine, right? That's just not our style, right? So from our perspective, because we're really looking to, we're typically looking to get a company and help them go from where they are to where they are times five, right? We want to try to keep as much of that leadership team intact and help them get there um, as much as we possibly can. When you think about um, your evolution as a leader of combining all of these people and the talented and the visionaries together, what have evolved inside you as a leader? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think um, that's one of the great things of the pandemic, one of the few great things that have come out of the pandemic, which, you know, I think maybe many people are seeing is, you know, with, with business kind of pausing there for a minute and then kind of rebuilding, especially in the marketing and advertising industry, like the whole industry was down 35% last year, not even including, you know, people who were more affected, like people in the events and experiential marketing business. Um, but we really spent a lot of time looking internally. And it was, I had to make this kind of decision where I was said, okay, we could keep cutting costs and putting along, or we can try to grow out of this and be ready for when the world comes back online. And it allowed me to really sit back and think about, okay, where should I be spending my time as a leader? Right. And um, in so many ways um, throughout the years, I think naturally as an entrepreneur, you try to spread your time across everything, right? If you're a CEO of a company, many CEOs are trying to touch everything, be part of everything. And I don't even say delegation, but I mean like literally have their hands on the pulse of everything. And for us, what I realized my best strength was is not having my hands on the pulse of everything, but solving bigger and bigger problems, right? My job is to solve for impediments in the organization more than anything else, something that is slowing us down. And as a result, I decided, well, then I need to step out of the things that I probably shouldn't be spending my time on uh, and bring the right people in to do that, right? And I think, uh, you know, a testament to that is how we've kind of reset up our organization through the pandemic. So we hired a new president of the organization, a gentleman named Jeff Stelmack. Uh, he came from, you know, the traditional marketing and advertising holding companies, right? And he had, he has done integration post acquisitions. Like that's what his role has been at many other organizations. And prior to this, I was doing all the integration myself, right? And being able to say, look, there's somebody else who knows the pitfalls of the big holding companies, as well as how we can be doing it different. And that's what they're here to do and create that accountability, that integration. Um, um, and kind of those best practices, let me put him in place. And then additionally to that, you know, I promoted our chief strategy officer into our COO, Debbie Kaplan, also coming from the big agency world. And I basically had them two together as a team with support of the rest of our leadership team, take over the day-to-day -day execution of the business, right? And, and integration. So basically my role shifted where, you know, all of a sudden I had a whole bunch of time on my hands in the beginning, I thought, because, you know, I wasn't in all the leadership meetings. I wasn't, you know, um, you know, I wasn't kind of managing these agencies day to day, but then very quickly, all of a sudden my days got very busy again with things that I really should be spending my time. Right. And, you know, for me as a CEO, and I think most CEOs, you know, we spend, you know, we need to spend more time on some of those things. Right. So things like vision, things like, you know, thinking holistically about the business, the model, where we're going, how are we going to address that? How do we adjust that? Right. People, you know, I always say CEOs are going to be you know, the number one talent recruiter for an organization, or at least they should be, right? You're out, you're networking, you're meeting people. You're going to be the one to sell the vision and get great A players over the finish line. And then the last piece of the puzzle, of course, besides, you know, finding new companies to acquire or any of the things we're dealing with on that side, um, it's solving problems, right? And there are constantly problems in an organization, no matter how well run you are, right? And that's your job as a CEO is to be able to find those issues and, and, and get them out of the way so the organization can keep moving. And Claude just said, something that I want to put a spotlight on. Where do I spend my time? A lot of CEOs ask them this very question. I talk to them all the time as an executive coach, and you've probably thought it too. Where do you spend your time now? The company must continue to evolve. You must evolve. And the way you spend your time must evolve. You've got to learn to let go 
of some of that day-to-day -day work so that you can focus on the most important aspects, the projects, the visionary work of the company. You've got to see around the corners. I promise you that you will find a way to use your time wisely if you're very intentional about it. But you must learn to let go of the day-to-day. -day. You can no longer be the bottleneck of the company. You can no longer attend every meeting that you want to attend. You have to strategically let go so that you can move to the next level. And a lot of people struggle with this. They're not sure where to let go or how this will work. or they, Their standards at such a place that they're not sure how the company will continue to grow because you've been so involved and that's what's gotten you here. But here's the thing that you need to really understand that because you're the bottleneck of the company, you have to keep letting go so that others are empowered to take care of the company so that you can focus on the highest value work. I hope people do this all the time. If you have any questions about this, just reach out to me, send me an email, find me on social media. I'd love to help you evolve as a leader, know where to let go, and help you really empower people the right way. Just reach out to me. I'd love to help you anytime. Now back to Claude. Claude, you, you really have something there for me because I've talked to a lot of leaders that struggle letting go of that day-to-day -day and maybe promoting people, bringing people from the outside, bringing people in from certain positions that you talked about for the president and COO. But you you went through this period where you weren't sure what you would do with your time, which is normal, but it is filled in nicely with the highest value things for the organization to keep you on a trajectory for growth. Is, is that fair to say? I think that's absolutely fair to say. I think that's absolutely fair to say. I mean, look, it's with a fast growing company, um, no matter whether it's inorganic, organic combination, you know, one of the things people don't realize is it's very, every time, it's kind of like the multiples of 12, right? It's like when you go from 12 employees to 60 employees, like it's very different. When you go from 60 to, you know, 144, right? It's very, very different. Your challenges become different. And I think the one the one thing I've been very fortunate about is, um, I, and I've learned, I should say, over my career, is because I used to be very micromanaging. Um, and I re really realized is I would much rather let go, be macro, let something break or someone fail or let the organization in some way have a misstep and fix it quickly, then try to handhold it for the next six to 12 months and never get to where you want to be. And I think, you know, as you grow as an organization, you need to not be afraid of having those missteps, those failures. Maybe you're going to lose a client, whatever it is, right? Like it's, it's tough in the, in the moment it will be hard. Um, but that sort of transparent, honest approach to doing things and allowing things to happen in some way or another is the best way that you'll be able to grow and continue to scale an organization because you know, there's only so much time in a day. You only have so much bandwidth, right? You know, at one point in time, I had, I had this thought process of, you know, if I wasn't working, you know, 20 hours a day and sleeping four and burning the candles, I wasn't. I wasn't delivering value. It wasn't, it wasn't the hardest working person in the room. Then I was never going to be that successful, right? And I think there's, there's, there is, there is something about being the hardest working, but there's also needs to be the smartest working, right? And I think again, we are, we are all humans. There's only so much bandwidth any one of us have, and so I think we need to be able to let go sometimes, let things happen, and then adjust and pivot and grow from there. If you happen to be listening on your phone, then make sure you check out what we have available on YouTube. We are getting a lot of traction over there on YouTube. You can just go to genehammett.com forward slash YouTube. The content's a little bit more visual there, and it really will help you become the extraordinary leader you want to be. Just go to genehammett.com forward slash YouTube. See you there. Claude, you've shared so much, much with us today. I really appreciate you being vulnerable enough to say that you're a recovering micromanager. I think we all are um, <laughs> in some ways, but I'd love to see what you've done in, in your journey here on uh, with Stadium Red and what you're going to continue to do because you focus on people so much. So thank you for being here. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for the time and uh, hope to be back someday soon. So let me wrap up here a little bit offline. You know, if you're planning an acquisition, you want to make sure that you get a lot of things right. Of course, you want to add value to the organization. But what Claude talked about was, is this a culture fit? How do we ensure that this culture will be integrated together? And how will we do that? And who's going to be responsible for that in the future? And all of the, the things that we talked about as far as aligning your executive team and letting go and truly being a visionary for your company are very important as you evolve into the leader that your team needs to be. If you want to check out how you can hang out with peers of fast growth companies, 
And make sure you check out fastgrowthboardroom.com where you can really connect with other leaders that are growing fast, becoming extraordinary leaders. And if you think you're a good fit for that, I encourage you to, to apply. Just go to fastgrowthboardroom.com. We hang out, we do some cool stuff with Porsches and things like that, but it's really about you evolving as a leader. So appreciate you being here on Growth Think Tank. As always, lead with courage. We'll see you next time.